Our gospel for tonight comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. It's found on uh, 1 to 6 and 16 through 21, found on page 4 in your New Testament, if you'd like to follow along. Hear the good news for this night. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and our Savior and friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There's a truly amazing part of our Ash Wednesday Gospel reading that largely goes unnoticed each year. And it's this. It was written exactly like somebody was having a conversation with a five-year-old. <laughs> Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. Why? Yeah. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you. Why? <laughs> Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Why? Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. To everything you should do in this gospel passage, there is a why associated with it. I don't know about your household, but the answer to why of because I said so only ends with tantrums. Why do I have to go to bed? Because I said so. But I don't want to go to bed. For a long time, in a church, in the church, because I said so was the governing rule. For a long time, the general masses were not allowed to read the Bibles themselves, the Bible themselves, because it was thought that it was too dangerous in the common person's hand. And so they could only rely on, because I said so, that's why. This changed a bit, thanks to people like John Wycliffe and Martin Luther, who translated the Bible into the language of the people. For Wycliffe, it was English. For Luther, it was German. But we never fully lost the because I said so that's in most churches. Why do we publicly confess even though I can confess to God in private? Because I said so. Why do we worship 
Sunday mornings when we could sleep in and still come in the afternoon because I said so. Why do we pray when there are times when prayer doesn't seem to have the responses we want? Because I said so. But because I said so is not good enough for my five-year-old, and it's certainly not good enough for all of you. It stifles our faith because your faith is not identical to my faith, and the things that work for my faith are not the things that work for your faith. They're not the ways that you need to find in order to better connect to this Jesus that faced temptation for 40 days and 40 nights. This Lent is an interesting time. There's a bit of a love-hate relationship with it. And it's even in pastors, this love-hate relationship. And I see it most prevalent when I see a uh, Protestant pastor interacting with a non-denominational pastor. Because the conversation usually goes like this. The Protestant pastor will say, you guys don't do Lent, right? And the non-denominational pastor will say, eh, not really, no. And then the Protestant pastor will give a long sigh. <sighs> That's nice. <laughs> As if there's long, this longing to be free from the shackles of soup and evening worship and devotionals. And don't get me wrong, Lent can be a lot for everyone. It can be a lot to take on. But there's an amazing beauty to Lent if we allow it. An incredible opportunity that stretches out towards the center of our being. A, a time in a chaotic world of go, 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 go. To instead lengthen our days by slowing down. By being mindful of what we are doing and why. My favorite explanation for the name of Lent is that it comes from an old German word, Lens, which related to the, spring, the lengthening of the spring days as more light comes on. <coughs> but I also think it's a lengthening of uh, moments of meaning in our lives. We have this phrase that comes up more and more. Do you want the long story or the short story? Generally, we choose the short story. And this is one of my favorite accidental sayings. It goes something like, I read this article recently. Well, I read the headline of the article, but I'm going to tell you anyways what the whole article was about as if I had read it. Because I thought the article was important enough to tell somebody about, but not important enough to actually read it in its entirety. Lent is meant to be that place where we hear the long story, where we take time for the long story, because the truth of our faith, the truth of our Christianity is that there is so much there in the depths of our faith, so much grace, so much meaning, when we allow ourselves to ask why and hear that answer. Think of just this Wednesday. This Ash Wednesday, when we're basically known for doing just one thing, putting ash on our foreheads. But why? Guess what? There's more than one answer. If you thought, I know the answer, unless you said answers in your head, there's more. Here's one. There are, 40 day, there are 40 passages in the Bible that are associated with ashes, that associate ashes with mourning and grief. In the Old Testament, you used ashes as signs of repentance. They would sit in ashes, roll around in them, sprinkle them on their heads, and even mingle them in their food and drink. We didn't do that tonight, don't worry. <laughs> they did this as an outward sign of their inward posture of repentance. We, in part, uh, use ashes as an outward expression of our need to begin again, to be renewed. But what about this one? Ashes are a sign of physical death, as in ashes to ashes. 
We began as dust, a joyless and lifeless existence, and our bodies will return to dust until we are raised again by Christ. By receiving ashes and keeping them on, we publicly proclaim our intent to die to worldly desires and leave, uh, live even more into Christ's image, which we focus on during this season of rebirth that is life. Or how about this? For over 1,200 years, on the day of ashes, faithful followers have approached the altar and received ashes upon their forehead. So you can start out by saying the church is old this answer. We do it because we've always done it that way. <laughs> but also, these ashes are made from burnt palm fronds that were blessed on the Palm Sunday of the previous year. Noting that times of joy, like the Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, can turn to ash. But even with ash, God is not done. Or, God, was, God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, which we read about in Genesis 2-7. In addition, Jesus healed the blind man with clay, earth and spit. We didn't add that to your soup either. In John 9, 6. We mark ourselves with ashes as a new beginning. Just like that Adam at the outset of Lent. Allowing the life of Jesus Christ to make us whole again. Which one is right? Should we take a vote? Do you want the long answer or the short answer? Let's spend this whole season of Lent looking at the long answers. Let us lengthen our faith, walk down the path that God has set for us, and be true people of the why. True people of Lent.